Um, what I wanted to do first off is just provide everybody with a, a common frame of reference for how a drug gets approved and then what happens after the drug gets approved in terms of off-label use and we'll talk about drug compendia. So just very briefly, um, when a manufacturer creates a drug and they want to get FDA approval, they do so with a clinical trial, uh, usually phase one, two, and three clinical trials around a particular disease. Once the phase three trial is complete, they look at the data, and if the data look good, they submit all of that to the FDA to request an approval and a label. And the label is a term of art. It's not just a little thing on your pill bottle that says take this this many times a day. It's the big sheet of paper that comes in the box of medication either to the pharmacist or to you if you get it shipped directly to you. It's one you usually toss after you get it. You don't, you don't look at it because it's got all sorts of Byzantine things on it. That label is a legal document that says that this company has data to back up this indication that's on that label. So for Cellcept, for example, the label is for, um, uh, sorry, organ, don you know, uh, organ transplant patients, for immune suppression and transplant patients. Now, once that drug is approved for that indication, physicians can use it for that indication, but they can also use it for any other condition that they think it has a rational basis to be used for, and that's called off-label use. So I can write a prescription for Cellcept for myasthenia patients as an off-label use for that medication. And historically, that's sort of how medicines worked. It's, it's uh, physicians using me medications in ways that were different than it was studied for because we have a rational basis for doing so. The other way that companies can do, and some companies do, is once you begin to use it as an off-label product, um, if the company wants to increase their market share perhaps or get a label indication for that drug, they can go back and do a study for that drug in what's currently being used as in its off-label way, like for myasthenia, and do a couple studies and see if they can show efficacy then they can go to the FDA and get another label approval for that particular indication. A lot of companies don't want to do that because it's expensive and it takes a lot of time. And it's not really, if, it, if they don't think it's going to increase their market share, they'll just leave it alone and let everybody prescribe it off-label. And historically, again, that's worked pretty good. Between insurance companies and physicians and drug companies, we sort of had this agreement that that's kind of how medicine works. And the law recognizes the same thing. I do another talk on off-label use and all sorts of liability things, but Generally speaking, the law says as long as there's a rational basis to use it in an off-label way, we're not going to make a big deal about it. So um, the other little piece of the puzzle that's out there are what are called drug compendia or compendium, a compendium. And these are companies that look at all the data out there around a particular drug and compile a little list of, of um, science, scientific data that supports the drug's use in an off-label way. And a lot of insurance companies now prescribe or subscribe to these different compendia. They're all private subscription-only entities, and there's a lot of them in this country. And each insurance company can subscribe to as many or as few as they like, and they look to the compendia to see if there's any support in the literature for the way this physician wants to use this particular drug. So now you have sort of a middle person uh, arbitrating the use of the medication between the physician the patient and the insurance company that, that up until the last few years we really haven't heard much about them but in the last f four or five years we started to see the rise of the compendia as a way for insurance companies to say there's no data for this medication. So if the, the physicians that work for the compendia go through the literature and don't find support for a particular medication, cellcept and myasthenia, they'll say well there's no data for this so we're not going to cover it. There's data for prednisone perhaps and we'll cover that but we won't cover cellcept. So that's where we are right now. We're seeing more and more of the pushback, and that occurs not just with Cellcept, but with uh, Imuran. We see it with IVIG, except in the acute settings. Um, I don't, I haven't got much pushback for plasma exchange yet, um, but we're starting to hear more and more of this as we go forward. So um, what we're trying to do on the advocacy committee is try and figure out, there, there's a couple of ways to do this, to try and, and attack this problem. And one is to just sort of do hand-to-hand -hand combat with the insurance companies when they deny a medication for a patient, um, which is what we've all been doing. Um, and that's okay. It's not very efficient, but it's okay. The bigger lever that we'd like to pull is getting inside the compendia and, and submitting applications for the medications that we use in an off-label way to the compendia and say, look, these work, and we'd really like to keep using them. 
Um, that's a hard nut to crack. Uh, we've, we've made some inquiries about that process and it's very, uh, it's, it's not an open process, it's not transparent. Um, drug companies can go to the compendia and submit data for their medication for this, for an indication. So uh, is it Genzyme that makes mycophenolate? Genzyme can go to the compendia and say, we'd like to submit our, an application to get approved for off-label use but they'd have to do it with every single compendia to make headway because different insurance companies carry, subscribe to different compendia. So it's a very, it's a very Byzantine process and we're just sort of trying to figure this out. The other way to do it and the, the way that I, I think might bear some fruit is to talk to your legislators, your senators mostly, to begin to bring some pressure to bear on that side of the equation. Um, I, I think that's something we can all do and it's fairly easy now with, with um, email. All of our senators have a link on their own Senate website to their email trough and it goes and you'll get an answer in a few weeks. Um, I've been doing that for the last few months for different things um, and it works. They, they respond. Now whether it changes anything, I don't know yet, but we're, that's a different story. Um, so that's where we are with, with the environment and so what we thought we'd do today is is go through a few things um, and, and give you some ideas about how you can fight sort of the mono a mono thing and on the grassroots level, um, and then maybe some some pearls from these people who have had more experience with talking with insurance companies and, and see if they give you any any bits of wisdom. What I always tell the first thing patients can do when they are diagnosed, the best thing you can do to help out your medical professional is keeping a symptom diary, something that says your condition. You know. How long do your pills take to kick in? How long do those side effects of those pills last? What activities do you do that make those pills get, you know, work through quicker? Anything you can write down about your condition and how it relates to, you know, what all the different treatments you're on will be great and wonderful to help out here. Um, these diaries actually have helped me in my position get a lot of different medications approved, have helped me greatly get IVIG approved. Um, as I think they were talked about earlier, I'm just going to not talk about them anymore because I really don't want to take away from anybody else's time. If you have any qu questions later, feel free to uh, come up and ask me about them. Uh, we uh, Choosing insurance. We'll go with that one next because I don't want to stay there. Um, that's the big thing here, choosing your insurance. How do you know what insurance plan is good for you. Uh, I often tell my patients to, you know, think about key questions like, do you travel often? Do you have medical equipment and other things that you have to take with you when you travel? All these kind of questions are something very important that you're going to need to know when you go into buying health insurance. Uh, the big thing is, look at buying health insurance like buying your first home. You're going to want to know things about the area where you're going to live. Are your doctors in network? You know, are they in the area? Uh, what are your utilities per month? That is going to be what your prescription costs are. So asking uh, a lot of questions about the insurance companies you're interested in. Give them a call. Write them letters. So really look into them and do any research, um, making sure that you're going to be really happy with that match. So what's going on with your prescriptions? Uh, we're going to, like I said, I'm sorry if I'm cutting a lot of things off here. I don't want to take away from anybody else. Um, as uh, we had mentioned, there's this big bad monster called the Compendia right now. This is partially what's been going on with some of your insurance costs. Uh, each insurance pretty much follows this basic model. It is a, uh, let's just call this a tier uh, a model of a tiering system for a prescription drug cost plan. Tier one, that's your lowest out-of-pocket cost. Tier five, that's gonna be the most amount out of your personal pocket. So when you're looking at these insurance companies, you also have to look, can I afford my tier copay for my medication? Um, when you call, you can say, hey, I'm on Mestinon. What is my Mestinon on this plan? And they'll probably tell you right now, probably tier four or tier five. That's generally where um, my patients' medications have been falling for the mesthenon. Um, when you're looking at this, say you call me and you say, hey, my medication for my mesthenon, it's $50 a month. What can I do? Um, you can call your doctor's office and they can do this thing called a tier exception, uh, where we can generally take the cost of that medication and get it down. Uh, 
Common medications we can use uh, to get that cost down is prednisone. Some insurance couples, uh, companies will take azathioprine and mycophenolate, the Celsept and the Imurin, even though they're off-label, they still, they'll still accept them as formulary alternatives um, if you've been on those. So that is one thing you can do about the tiering system for your, your Celsept, or not your Celsept, I'm sorry, your Mestinon prescriptions. Uh, there is one big kicker with this though. About two years ago, Medicare decided that if they do not have a formulary agent on a lower drug tier. So let's say your Mestinon is on tier three or four, but there's no formulary alternative on tier one, they do not have to grant you a tier exception. They do not have to give you a lower cost for that drug. There's no drug there, that doesn't matter. All right, we don't have to cover it. So that's why I brought up the prednisone and the mycophenolate and the emuran. Um, those are alternatives to your therapy. They're not the same drug, they don't do the same thing, but they all are, are alternatives for you. With that being said, uh, other things you can do, I'm gonna actually go back off something Dan had mentioned earlier. Uh, he had brought up the fact that you, know, you can get involved and you can go to your uh, legislators to complain if you are going through these problems, if you're having problems getting prescription coverage. After you do what is called a level two appeal, First, there's your, and um, we'll, we'll go through the steps here. First, your doctor's office requests a prior authorization for your medication if it's not covered on a, you know, if it's not covered. The next step, it, your doctor's office will get denied. They have to send a, an appeal. It could either be a written appeal or they could do it over the phone and that will get denied. And this is what we call, a, next step is a level two appeal. This goes to a third party group. Um, it is not your health insurance directly, it's just, it's supposed to be a bi non-biased entity. When they come back and they deny it, you can actually go and send a complaint to your attorney general um, for your state. I know Pennsylvania, there is a uh, website and there is a actual link where it goes file a complaint, medical complaint. And that's another way too that you can also, we've had quite a few patients doing that after their level two for myco mycophenolate or imuran get denied, they can actually go ahead and submit that level, uh, the complaint to the attorney general. So that is another step that you guys can also uh, get involved, when, involved with if you're having problems with those drugs. All right, so we're gonna get away from what insurance, you know, just the insurance for a little bit here and what you can do as, for yourself as a patient to help get your medications. There are two sites I like to use. You can do these for any drug. It doesn't just have to be for your myasthenia gravis meds. This can be for your asthma medication, your heart medication, whatever. I have patients calling in and they can't get their meds and let's say I, I did try to get them something approved um, and the insurance didn't cover it. This is also in your uh, book. I see some people taking pictures it is in your, uh, the slide is in there. It's at the first one, der, one under shop around. Um, but these, webs these two websites I'm gonna mention are gonna help you uh, astronomically in different situations. So needymeds.org. This site lets you see what pharmacies have discount programs. And uh, you can search the listings of drugs they have on their plans. Um, Sam's Club has been my savior for patients for mycophenolate and azathioprine. Uh, I don't know if there's Sam's Clubs wherever you live, but this is what we call a warehouse store, like a Costco. I don't know what other names there might be. BJ's, okay. So these, they sometimes have like a membership fee. For example, the Sam's Members Plus that I've actually had that help patients out, it's $100 a year. And what they do is the azathioprine and mycophenolate are both are $10 per quantity of 30. So if you factor in a lot of people with insurance, they pay about $80 a month sometimes with their copay. That's cheaper than their copay. That's $48 if they're doing it four times a day. 
That's $48 a month. So this is something, a really big and important step that you can do as a patient on your own. You don't need your doctor's office to get involved. You just need them to call it into the pharmacy, whatever one you pick. But yeah, so there's one thing you can do. Check out that website with all your meds. Look to see if they're on any discount program with your uh, current pharmacies around you. Uh, Needy Meds also lets you check for um, available patient assistance programs. We're just gonna call them PAPs. Valiant's patient assistance program here for Mestinon is not on Valiant's website. You have to come to needymeds.org to actually pull up the patient assistance program file. They do have a drug, drug discount card on this website that does actually work at most pharmacies. The only problem I have with this one's drug discount card is they don't keep a running log of what drugs that they are, have on their discount program at the time. So you just take it to your pharmacy. Hey, is this discounted this week? Maybe. All right, so my second website I like to use. GoodRx does a lot of things that the Needy Meds does. Um, but it helps me find um, the estimated costs of medications at different pharmacies around me. Yes, Needy Meds also has this too, but the one on GoodRx.com is a lot more user friendly. Um, also, it has a mobile application. So if you're uh, technically inclined, you can get the mobile app for uh, GoodRx. Uh, Mestinon, uh, I think the syrup actually too, the tablets, the 60 milligram tablets and the syrup are on the drug discount program right now for this card. And a lot of things you probably don't realize, especially if you use this uh, GoodRx website, not all pharmacies have the same drugs for the same price. You can go, let's say, down Canal Street a block. Your medication's gonna be $200. Go the opposite way, it's 50. Not all prescriptions are the same price at every single pharmacy. So using a website like this will definitely help you keep your personal out-of-pocket costs down. Um, sometimes these companies can save you up to 80% on what you actually pay. Those PAPs, those patient assistance programs, um, there are a lot of times that you will get turned down for them. They may say, oh, you make too much money, or oh, you're on Medicare, or something like that. But the doctor's office can appeal their decision. You can appeal those drug companies' decisions for them to deny um, you to be on their patient assistance program. So if there is a case where it's, it's really severe, which I have had happen, patient can't really afford the medication. I, I didn't even have to submit fan financials one time to get them to approve it like that because it was such an urgent need. Those decisions can be appealed um, if you're rejected to be covered on a PAP. The reason why we started Patients Rising is just for a few reasons. Is we wanted to be the aggressive advocate. And we wanted to uh, do that for people in places like this. Uh, I've been in public policy and government for about 25 years, which is amazing since I'm only 36. Um, but um, I did not know a lot about this world. I knew a lot about healthcare, knew a lot about government, knew a lot about legislation, been around a long time in those things, and now in Washington, um, and met a lot of patients, been a lot involved in the patient space, uh, mostly in oncology. But you know, there is an entire world of patient advocacy that I don't think we really knew a lot about. It wasn't like we didn't care, it wasn't like we didn't, weren't looking. But what I've discovered is, and I've met thousands of patients, and every one of them, um, you know, we, we, uh, we just walk in, in, the, in their sacred sets. But the point I'm making is that I thought we were doing patient advocacy four, five, six, seven years ago, and the answer is we were only doing part of it. Because there are patients like you, and in the rare disease community, and organizations like this, that people never see, and I think that, um, I, and I didn't see. And so, I mean, every day my eyes get a little more wide open, and I get, it, I'm, I'm you know, thrilled and impressed, and then I'm a little sad, because I feel like there were years we, you know, did a lot of things for a lot of people, and a lot of activities, a lot of patients, and a lot of media, and I never met one person like you. I never met one person like Nancy, and I feel like, um, so I think in a lot of ways we're playing catch up. And I'm honored to be here, and I'm honored to be next to you. And I want to thank especially, not just MGFA, but I want to thank um, Kathy and Susan, who uh, reached out to me 
And um, I can tell you just from where I'm standing, you may have no idea what it's like for someone you don't know to write you a note uh, and say, we'd love to hear from you. And I mean, that is the, um, that makes all, all my days. So I want to say thank you to them and to the organization who allowed me to be here. Um, patients are living better and longer, and that includes you and the breakthroughs that we talked about. Um, we're seeing treatments and even the emergence of cures and things that were um, unimaginable 10 years ago, and certainly unimaginable in the ways you were talking about in the time that you've been involved here. And so there are breakthroughs, and there are uh, precision medications, personalized medications that are so close we can almost touch them and almost taste them in a way. Um, And this is the point I've been trying to tell people is that, you know, we're no longer surprised when a person with a chronic disease or a serious illness either you know, lives a full life or outlives me or even recovers. Like, we're not surprised anymore. I can tell you, you know, if I were to say, I walked, I took a left on Canal, I went to Poydras, and I went down um, Decatur, I didn't see one person who had too much to drink. Now, you would think that was amazing, of course, that, that's, that's impossible. Um, but I can tell you, like, think about the, not this room, but every other room in the world. Nobody is shocked. You know, there's a 91-year-old man from Georgia. He has cancer of the brain. He has cancer of the liver. He has full treatment, doesn't die. Full treatment, doesn't lose his hair. Full treatment, walks out of the hospital. Now, his name is Jimmy Carter. He was the president of the United States. But my point is, he's 91 years old. Like, nobody, like, I didn't fall, I should have fallen, I didn't fall out of my chair when I heard that he was gonna live. I didn't fall out of my chair when I heard that he didn't you know, lapse into a coma with this aggressive treatment. We should, in a way. We should, in a way. So what the first thing I wanna say is, the rest of the world is not shocked when you live to be 100. In some ways, I think that they should, but the, so you've won the first battle, which is people know it's possible, and you know it's possible. And I think that's, you know, that's the thing that I think we don't think about. It's like I said, it's like the turning of the earth. It is so subtle, you don't really notice it, but it's, most, but it's the most uh, uh, impactful, extraordinary thing. So the first thing I want to say is we should be surprised, but we're not. And that's a first breakthrough. But there's a lot of ways this, right, best of times. These are possible. But look, it's the worst as well. Um, patient access to the treatments that make those extraordinary things possible has never been tougher. I heard about, I was talking to people in the infusion aspect in the other room and hearing you here and all your extraordinary victories. And I think that's stunning. People out in the other room are saying, you know, we have an amazing record. We have, we have 80% reversal of denials. And, you know, they were celebrating. I, I was celebrating. 80% reversal. That's really great. That's really amazing. Oh, that, but that's devastating at the same time. You know, I'd like, you know, my elevator down here didn't fail, but 80% of the time it could save, and I, you know, but, but that's not good enough. You know, that's just called a workaround. You know, if, that, if every time I took the elevator from downstairs and it was gonna, you know, collapse and die, and they saved me 80% of the time, nobody would care. So the point is, I think that's, you know, people working hard, some amazing stories here, some amazing energy, and things are happening, but my gosh, I mean, the point is there's an entire world and industry and process that is called insurance denial. And so these amazing people work there fingers to the bone, and they work real hard, and doctors in the offices, and I've seen, I can tell you, 100 stories about that. And they're celebrating this 80% or plus or more win, but you know what, honestly, it ought to be 100, and it's time to change the default system. My point is, right now, it is not good enough to have a system by which then excellent people can have excellent results that 80% of the time help you. It is time to turn the system to its default setting to be pro-patient and not pro-process. And until that changes, you will never, ever achieve all that healthcare can give you. Quickly, regulatory roadblocks, you talked a little bit, Nancy, but these, you know, the point is, it shouldn't take 10 years for a breakthrough medication to go through the process. It sure as hell didn't take 10 years for the next iPhone to get to the market. You wanna know why? You wanna know why? Because there's billions of dollars at stake and every day it doesn't get the market, they're losing money, and you better be damn sure, pardon my language, but darn well sure that they're gonna do whatever they have to do to get this next phone into my hands so I can get it in my three-year-old twin's hands so he can break it and I can get another one. But the point is, it's not gonna take, people wouldn't tolerate it. Would you tolerate taking 10 years, 10 years to get your next model of car? Nobody would stand for it. Nobody would stand for it. We shouldn't be standing for this.
Look, I'm not anti-insurance. We need a robust insurance industry. We are not. We're opposed to single payer. If insurance companies don't have a robust business, they don't make a profit, they can't pay claims, and therefore they can't treat patients. And so we can't have that. Um, but I am enormously concerned about modern insurance practice and the process in the world you talked about. It is, it is simply not right and is not fair, and ultimately I think they will lose money denying patients and having you get sicker to where they are going to have to spend $100,000 or more per patient and per treatment. So to me, it, this, this is a losing game and worse than a zero sum. And so I, I, I attack the central premise that the denial industry is not just bad for you, it is ultimately bad for business, and that is a point that you can take. I'm working on two different points. Um, I've got a, uh, a concern about the process by which insurance has made roadblocks. We call the barriers to access, which are real, um, about something called the value frameworks. Just, just me 10 seconds on this. You are in a war. You're in a war for the word value. You're fighting your value against system value. And, if, and somebody's going to win. I'm going to tell you right now, somebody's going to win. And if you lose, you're done. If your value is not greater than the value of the system, they're both important, but if you lose the fight over the word value, you're done. You're done. You will always be hostage to what's good for the system or what's good for the patient. Ins our problem is with insurance design and these five things we'll talk about, and the last one especially. Step therapy, which has been mentioned, which is, which is a big part of your lives. Prior authorization, specialty tiers mentioned here, structured here. Um, non-medical switching, and finally PBMs. Just one point, and I want to talk about all these, which I won't. Um, what you just described is a PBM crisis. The PBMs are the pharmacy benefit managers. I have great friends who live in St. Louis and who work for Express Scripts, a multi, multi, multi-billion dollar business. Great. I met Stephen uh, Miller, the number two man. He makes $17 million a year. I, I wish I made $17 million a year. He's a brilliant man. He's very, very, very smart, and they run enormously large business. They are the go-between. They're the ones negotiating. We need them to be successful to negotiate and bring your medications from the manufacturer to the insurance industry, to the pharmacy, and the like. But hang on a second. What you talked about, what your, your success story through Sam's Club, was it BJ's, your success story? Every one of those is a workaround, like I talked about the elevator not falling, is a workaround of a flawed system. Great, you made it, great, I love it, $10, for, that, that's amazing. But honestly, why are we doing a rescue mission for a bad system? This is a multi, multi, multi-billion dollar system that is supposed to be for your interest. Instead, they are sitting on billions and billions of dollars as middlemen, go-betweeners, between the drug industry, the insurance companies, Walgreens across the street, I think, could have been a little hazy, and everybody else. So when you got your $10, you paid $10, you get your medication, you pay $20 or $40. That's great, that's great, but that's a workaround of the system. So fix that system or one day, actually, honestly, there won't be that. Fix the, fix the system or one day, honestly, Sam's Club can't help you. And believe me, they'll shut that down in two seconds if they can. So I congratulate you on your workarounds. I congratulate you on your, on your brilliance and your determination. It's greater than mine. But I'm telling you, if you don't fix the first part of the system and reform PBMs, there won't be that other workaround, and then you'll be paying hundreds of dollars every single time, every single time. What can you do? Well, I'm doubling up here a little bit. Quick. Appeal the decision, request an external review, file a complaint. You all know about that things. And also I want to mention um, two points. One is you mentioned the uh, attorneys general, very, very important, but also there's a new uh, uh, superstructure in states of the insurance commissioners. Now, that's a little, some of them are, they're all different. And I know you don't need one more lecture about politicians, but insurance commissioners in the states, um, you know, some of them deal with health care, some of them don't. It, this, I, I'm not big, it's complicated, but every state's got one. About half of them are actually uh, elected officials. You know, they run for office like anybody else. And about half of them are appointed by the governor or something like that. You know, it's real close. You know, I come from California, the insurance commissioner, you'll be unsurprised, is mostly uh, deals with auto insurance. Uh, now they're regulating more and more of health. But so I don't know, so all of your states have an insurance commissioner. Some of them are active politicians who have an interest in your vote and your future. And so I think it's another aspect to explore to see if they can help you, just as you described with attorneys general. And last point here, I know you don't need another website. 
Um, but take this one, coveragerights.org. Coveragerights.org. And I will be here to tell you all about this. Some great information. There's some great resources. And these, this material exists for you. And what she talked about as well. So this is, I, 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 I like that in the site you mentioned. There's a lot there. Look at coveragerights.org and see if it can help you. And see if it can help you. I think you know about this, about, you know, I said when less means less. Um, but I take two points I want to say is that if we spend less on medication, we're going to get less health. I mean, I, 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 I'm a history major, not a math major. We spend less on, on health, we're going to get less health. It is crazy to have, to have developed a utilization ideal that if we just spend less on you and spend less on you and spend less on you, we will save money in the end. That is absolutely not happening. And for people in the rare disease community, it costs as much to make your drug as it does for breast cancer. We need them all. We need them all right now. But it does cost the same. So look, you need to, again, change the default setting. They need to have the incentive to make a drug for 50,000 people as they do for 5 million. They have, if they don't have that, they're not going to do it. This iPhone right here, they say is good for everybody. That's why there are so many of them. So to me, you have to incentivize and justify and move forward a system where a company and entity can break through a miracle for you as it will for prostate cancer or somebody like me. I make a point real here about the hyper-focus of cost. Look, you hear about a lot about this. Of course cost of the healthcare is a concern. Of course resources are finite. Of course they are. Of course they are. We need to be good managers, but listen, um, if we attack an industry, we're going to get less of it. And the focus on cost, I call the hyper-focus on cost, and we need responsibility. We do not need rip-off artists. We do not need people taking advantage of people in the pharmaceutical industry. We don't need that. We must call that out. But listen, there's one thing to us that the hyper-focus on cost has caused, and it is this. It has made a determination that you're not worth it. You're too expensive to treat, and you're too costly to save, and it has made patients, and I am not making this up, that you are now a commoditized drain on resources. Not just tragedy, we all feel sorry for you, but what they are saying is you are actually so expensive that you're taking away from, I, make, I am not making this up, schools, students, fire departments, roads, that you are a drain on resources that we can all use rather than a group of individuals, human beings, that we know how to treat and cure and live for the rest of your life. And until we look at patients like a community of human beings we know how to help, rather than a group of people who are just super expensive, then honestly, you will lose again. You have to win that fight too. My concerns then in three ways. The nature and development of value frameworks that I talked about. What I said is the, the variable anti-patient infrastructure. There is an anti-patient infrastructure in every one of those denials that gets reversed. And every time somebody out there with their infusion makes 80, wins 80% of the time, every one of those is a system that is meant to stop you and stall you that, you, that they have managed to get through an, an amount of time. But all of that is a superstructure of a system that is geared and built against you, and it's very recent. It's not, not 40 years ago. The things that we're seeing in denials, the things that we're seeing in delays, are unimaginable 10 years ago. This is relatively new. So you're in a new fight, in a new war, and new challenge. There's a better way. We have solutions, and I'll make a point, about the authentic patient voice. Look, I, I feel like, I know you don't believe this, you know, some people think I'm a pretty glib talker. Um, I'm okay at this, but your voice is 10,000 times stronger than mine and 10,000 times more meaningful than mine, and you are the authentic patient voice, your families and caregivers and the patients themselves. You are the only voice that can truly lift this up and reverse it. I make a point here on my screen here, heard by regulators, legislators, public leaders, and the media. Um, let me make a point, and I heard you said about sending notes to politicians. I have another confession to make. So I worked a long time in, uh, in uh, don't, they, don't, they don't look too unhappy right now. So I worked a lot of years in politics and campaigns and elections, and I can tell you that um, you're not, you're right. Do it, get on record, send the email, get down to them. I'm telling you something, politicians, senators, congressmen, your legislators at home, they get thousands of notes every single week. 
every single, they are all, they're all meaningful. And they don't go in the trash. Hold on a second. They do not go in the trash. But there are so many of them. I don't want to make you competitive with all the people sending notes that then go into a giant pile. So first of all, take his advice. He is correct. That is good advice. But listen, you can go further. Your voice and your story has to stand on top of your email and your record and your name then to then turn this around. My one, uh, uh, this is not a political point. I'm trying to tell you that politicians mostly just don't understand what it is you're going through. Not because they're stupid, they're not stupid. And they, they don't care, of course they care. But they don't know what to do. And they, and they hear a lot of competing voices. And an insurance lobbyist has a strong voice and they're not stupid either. And your voice has gotta be there right alongside it to match it or work with it or overcome it. And so to me, what I'm hoping is today, if you would, is we want to take your voice and your story. So please, I'll be here for a, uh, after we finish, if I, if I ever finish. Um, and that honestly, if you would, you know, I want your names, I want your stories, we'll help you. I will make media for you or interview you or, or, or publish you. That's what we're trying to do. So to me, with everything else you're doing and everything else that's going on here, um, I'm hoping that you will allow us to be as involved as you can and want to be on taking your story, your specifics, and what you're going through and taking it to the next level of involvement and understanding. What do we need most of all? Ultimately, patients need air. Well, we do too. But I call that access, innovation, and regulatory reform, A-I-R. Look, so much politics, so much infighting. Get away from that. Ultimately, you need to win the fight for access, and it's part of that too, access, innovation, and regulatory reform. If you win those three fights, then you will win, and um, you will, um, you know, ultimately, honestly, you will be amazed. Um, the difference that you can make in addition to all the other fighting and all the other things you overcome and all the other workarounds and all the other amazing successes that you can change hearts and minds and decisions and create, I guess, a new structure and a new future that is in your favor and not in the systems. Thank you very much. So my name is Elizabeth Patnode. I'm a clinical appeals RN, and I work for Excelicare, a Briova RX infusion services company, and we are a specialty pharmacy that provides home infusion uh, therapy for patients with multiple diagnosis, and this includes IVIG for patients with myasthenia gravis. I'm on the clinical resource and special appeals unit teams, and what we do is we receive referrals, referrals from the doctor's office, and our team assists with the prior authorization process, and then the appeals, uh, if that authorization is denied, then we assist the doctors in the appeals process to try to get the patient um, approved for that, what they originally denied. So our team in 2016, um, we have, overturned or assisted with overturning 333 denials for IVIG, home infusion therapy. <laughs> this is uh, approximately 82%. We're about in that 80% range of the denials that we try to assist with overturning. This includes all of the diagnosis that we help um, for the patients that we cover. I don't have any specific MG numbers for you right now as far as how many we get overturned, but we get a very large number of um, MG patients approved for home infusion therapy for IVIG because insurance company definitely likes to deny the IVIG for home infusion therapy. If you're at home, you're doing great, right? That's what they think, so why do you, why do you need IVIG? <laughs> so on the denials, oh, a patient advocate. I'd like to say our, I consider myself a patient advocate because what we are doing is helping uh, these patients gain access to the complex medical um, treatments that they need to live their lives. So denials, number one reason that I see for denial for IVIG, home infusion for um, patients with myasthenia gravis is for no exacerbation. There's no evidence of exacerbation, you're not in crisis. Insurance companies do not like to cover IVIG in, in general for maintenance therapy for myasthenia gravis. If they think you're at home, you're not in crisis, you're not having exacerbation. They feel like that you know, um, you're doing well and you don't need that. Often with the denial, there's a couple different options to appeal. Number one would be a peer-to-peer -peer option, and um, number two would be a written appeal. A peer-to-peer -peer option, uh, we always encourage the physician if, the, if he or she is able to do a peer-to-peer. -peer. 
The physician can call and talk to the medical reviewer. They can talk uh, peer to peer, address the issues and the reasons for the denial uh, right there. They can get it all worked out. And a lot of times, um, that seems like that's the best opportunity for a denial to get overturned. However, peer to peers are, are not as easy as it sounds. You can't just call up and talk to somebody uh, right when you, when you call. Often uh, you have to call and schedule. Um, give them certain times that they can call you back. There's long hold times. Physicians are very busy, and um, it's just not a very convenient option sometimes. So if that's not an option, sometimes it's not an option at all, but if it is an option and it can't be done, then a written appeal would be the next step um, to get the denial overturned. So what we do when we're assisting with, a, with an appeal is we want to review the denial rationale. We look at the denial letter. We find the reasons why are you denying this medication for this patient. And then we want to look at the medical policy of the insurance company that they have. So um, if we feel like that they have met the criteria of the insurance company, we'll address that and point out the reasons why. We're going to look at clinical, medical, doc uh, medical doctor visit notes, labs, testing, all of the things that support the diagnosis for this patient and their, and their signs and symptoms. Um, and then we're going to look at... Um, we're going to call the patient. If we feel like we need additional information, we'll call the patient and gather that information. Then we'll help organize an appeal letter, assist that doctor's office. Um, of course, the doctor is involved in all of this and, and the patient as well. Everybody's on board. We're all working together for the same goal. The things that we're looking for when we're reviewing this information um, is, of course, the diagnosis, how, how you come to the diagnosis, testing, um, you know, like the antibody testing, um, single fiber EMGs, all of the things the signs and symptoms, uh, everything that has been used, the exam and testing to support the diagnosis for this patient. Very important is what we want to know also is the signs and symptoms that the patient's having. We need to know the severity, the history, the current signs and symptoms, everything that's going on with this patient, um, and the reasons that they need IVIG um, home infusion therapy. So it's very important to know um, if this patient's ha had a severe symptom history. Have they been in the hospital, crisis, um, respiratory failure? A lot of patients have been in the ICU intubated because of their respiratory failure. And it's, it's very important to, to know that information when you're trying to appeal a denial because um, these are the things that will um, support the use for the IVIG in the home. So to address the denial, uh, we also need to know tried and failed therapies. It's very, very important to know what the patient has tried and failed. Um, insurance company is going to say, give them pred prednisone, right? Everybody knows that uh, prednisone is the number one thing that they want, want to see being used. But there's all, all sorts of reasons that um, different therapies do not work for a patient or they can't be used for a patient. So we want to know that information as well. So what we're going to do is we're going to understand the denial's rationale and then we're going to address that reason. We're going to dispute it. Why is that a not a good reason for this patient to have IVIG? We're going to tell them why it is, why they do need IVIG and that the rationale is, is not correct. It's, like I said before, it's very, very important to address the severity of the symptoms in the past and current. Often IVIG is denied because the insurance companies um, don't believe you're in a current crisis. However, we know that sometimes a patient can be in a, a sustained crisis where they need IVIG therapy along with their other medications or in place of if they're not able to take the other ones um, because they're in a sustained crisis and without that therapy in a certain amount of time they will be in crisis. So we'll highlight the tried and failed therapies, uh, the contraindications, if they can't take them, are they having, are they refractory MG? Um, uh, do they have breakthrough symptoms while they're on their current medication? And then if the patient has been on IVIG already, it's, and it's documented um, improvement of their symptoms, then of course we're gonna need to know that as well. We're also going to cite research because we do know that there are articles that research shows that IVIG is effective in inducing rapid improvement in refractory MG with acute exacerbation, as well as for inducing and maintaining remission. And that's very important information for insurance companies to know. So we'll cite those referrals, uh, reference sources, and include them in the denial letter and appeal letter um, for the denial. And often that's very important for the insurance companies to see that and they'll refer back to it and understand that there is research that shows it can be beneficial for patients um, even when they're not in a current crisis that requires hospitalization. It is a safe and effective um, therapy for autoimmune diseases and that would include Mycenae gravis as well. So we're, what we're doing is just trying to show that IVIG for some patients is actually medica medically necessary. 
for the symptom control and to prevent severe medical complications and functional decline and to avoid costly hospitalizations. One major point we, also like, we always include is, um, do you want this patient to end up in the hospital? Is that more cost effective for the insurance company as opposed to um, treating them right off the top? So, and number one, we want the, you know, why do you want the patient to get to the point where they have to be in the hospital anyway? That's really not good patient, you know, that's not making the patient number one and caring about the patient as, as they should. So just to highlight the important things, what I would say for patients, as uh, Michelle was talking about, you may try to find an insurance company that you know will cover the things that you need. However, people don't always have a choice what insurance companies they have, what, what, what insurance coverage you have. You have the coverage of whatever your employee gives you, right? Sometimes you don't have but one choice. Or your insurance may change over time because of your job or a family member's job, whoever covers you for insurance. You may become older and you're on Medicare. There's a lot of different rules. Medi uh, medical policies are different for medical insurance companies all across the board. And so that's why we review the medical policies when we're working on trying to uh, appeal these denials. So for patients, number one, report your signs and symptoms accurately. It's very important that the physician understands your symptoms. Some people are, they really downplay their symptoms. I'm doing fine, so it's no problem, but they have to, I'm not choking on my food. But say you have to swallow two or three times every time you take a bite. That's a swallowing issue. That needs to be reported to your doctor. So the doctor can document that and the insurance company can see that your symptoms are severe and that can affect your quality of life and, and your medical um, status. Um, shortness of breath, uh, weakness, function, functional disabilities. If you're having a hard time combing your hair because you can't lift your arms up, well, I can still comb my hair. That's still a functional disability. You, you can comb your hair but not as, you know, or you can brush your teeth but like you wear out before you can get done taking care of your, your needs in the morning. So that is all needs to be um, reported to your doctor. It's very important. You don't have to be in a wheelchair necessarily to be having functional disabilities with your symptoms. It's very important that insurance companies know the symptoms that you're having and how um, they're affecting your quality of life. So um, keep your doctor's appointments. Sometimes if you're on IVI, I'm speaking of IVIG, I know you take a lot of therapies in my experiences with IVIG, but a lot of times if a patient's on IVIG therapy, when it becomes um, time to authorize, reauthorize, the insurance company will look at the most recent documentation. If you've skipped your doctor's appointment and you haven't had a doctor's appointment in say nine months, I have seen doc uh, insurance companies will deny the reauthorization for the IVIG therapy because there's no current um, no recent documentation that you've seen your doctor. They feel like if you have such medical needs, you should be seeing your doctor on a regular basis. So I would encourage you as patients to keep your appointments when they're scheduled. And when you do keep your appointments, comply with the doctor's orders, report back those signs, those symptoms that you're having, the side effects, so documentation can be made of how you're doing on these therapies and that it needs to be continued if you're doing well on it. As for medical professionals, I would say um, document, 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 document well. You'd be surprised how many doctor's visit notes that we get that says um, patient has MG symptoms doing better. Please continue IVIG. Insurance companies do not like to see that. They want to know exactly what's going on with the patient. They want to know the past medical history um, and they want to know the current, his, the current signs and symptoms. So it's very important that physicians and, and medical providers document well the things that you know about your patient. So um, hospitalizations in the past, functional disabilities, tried and failed therapies, have they had a thymectomy, plasmapheresis, prednisone, imuran, Cellcept, all of the medications and therapies that we've been talking about, have they tried them and be specific as to why. If they cannot take prednisone any longer, specifically say why. This patient has diabetes, their glucose is elevated, they cannot take prednisone any longer, they've now developed osteoporosis for the reason of, um, because of the prednisone that has caused it. So be very, very specific in your documentation because we do see a lot of IVIG denials overturned um, once we can uh, show to the insurance company the reasons they can't have the other therapies or the reason the other therapies are not working for them. Um, uh, another thing to, to know if you're um, a, a physician and you're documenting for your patient, if they've been on IVIG, be specific on how it's helped them. Be specific if they have wearing off effects before the three weeks or four weeks when they're gonna get their next dose. If you're gonna to try to taper the dose, document how they did when you did tried the taper. If you try to discontinue and they didn't do well and you want to get them back on, document, document, document. It's very, very important that it's spelled out clearly. If you're having a, uh, sometimes an insurance will be, uh, will deny for a, a dose change. And so if you specifically document the reasons you're changing this patient's dose, that would be very important for um, 
for reauthorization or for a new dose. Also, um, drug brand changes. Sometimes you know patients will have a difficulty with one brand but do well on another brand. So if you're going to change your patient um, on brands for uh, the reason of side effects for one brand or whatever reason you have, it needs to be documented very clearly because um, if it's a non-formulary brand, that can also be approved, but there needs to be clear documentation as to why this patient needs um, this brand of IVIG. Sometimes a patient will change from one insurance to a, a company to another. This insurance company covers GammaGuard. This insurance company doesn't. They only use Gamunex C. So you would have to explain this patient's been on GammaGuard for a certain period of time and they need to continue because they've been doing well on it and the, the change in their therapy may interrupt the, um, the progress that they've made. So again, the highlight for doctors, please document well because it's very important when it comes to getting authorizations and appeals overturned. So the bottom line is we just, for appeals, when we're appealing denials, we need to paint a whole picture of this patient's past and current situation, what, how serious their symptoms were, how well certain medications worked and didn't work, and then the reason that it's medically necessary for these certain patients to be on IVIG home infusion therapy. And then I could go on, there's like different levels, first level, second level, external. Those things do need to be taken into consideration. A first level appeal, if you can get all of the information and try to get it overturned on the first level, obviously that's the best choice. If you move on to the next level, especially if you go to external, it just has to be taken into consideration at the external level. Sometimes if that is denied, then it will be a period of time before the insurance company will allow prior authorization to be submitted, like six months on some, in some cases. So all of those things need to be taken into consideration in each medical policy for each different insurance company is a little bit different. So we look at the whole picture, including the medical policy and the patient's picture themselves. And it's just important to, to prove why this medication is medically necessary for this certain patient for the reasons that are specific to that patient. Thank you.